Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a review of Oceans of Venus by Isaac Asimov. Dane reads. So this is one of his lucky star books. It was actually written under the pseudonym Paul French. I'm going to read you the blurb, then I'm going to go through and check out my tabs. I don't have a huge number of tabs, but I mean the book itself is only 140 odd pages long. Uh, I will say I really enjoy the lucky star books. I think they're nice little, just quick reads, but with a lot of that Asimov greatness. They also kind of blend sci-fi and mystery. I would say they're more sci-fi, but they generally have some sort of mystery at the heart of them that lucky stars investigating. So here we have the blurb. In the extraterrestrial odyssey of David Starr, Space Ranger, on the planet Venus, the undersea civilization of the colonizing Earthmen is threatened with disaster. Survival becomes a strange fight so far beneath the surface of the glittering waves. David Starr arrives to combat the evil menace of the depths. He finds only one enemy, and that of the worst kind, the enemy within his own mind. Asimov has created yet another story of cosmic proportions to further delight his many readers. Now, I want to start by reading you the foreword. I'm just going to read you the whole thing because I think this provides some quite important context into this. Uh, I will say as well, if you've ever um, seen Future Army, you know Hypnotoad? Hypnotoad is in this, except it's a whole race of them. And they're, they're basically the toads are sort of being deployed to um, change, you know, like politics and all that kind of stuff. So, foreword. This book was first published in 1954 and the description of the surface of Venus was in accordance with astronomic beliefs of the period. Since 1954, however, astronomical knowledge of the inner solar system has advanced enormously because of the use of radar beams and rockets. In the late 1950s, the quantity of radio waves received from Venus made it seem that the surface of Venus might be much hotter than had been thought. On August 27, 1962, a rocket probe called Mariner 2 was launched in the direction of Venus. It skimmed by within 21,000 miles of Venus on December 14, 1962. Measuring the radio waves emitted by the planet, it turned out that the surface temperature everywhere was indeed considerably higher than the boiling point of water. This meant that far from having a worldwide ocean as described in this book, Venus had no ocean at all. All of Venus's water is in the form of water vapour in its clouds, and the surface is exceedingly hot and is bone dry. The atmosphere of Venus is, moreover, denser than had been thought and is almost entirely carbon dioxide. Nor had it been known in 1954 how long it took Venus to rotate on its axis. In 1964, radar beams bounced off Venus's surface showed that it was turning once in every 243 days, 18 days longer than its year, and in the wrong direction as compared with other planets. I hope that the readers enjoy this story anyway, but I would not wish them to be misguided into accepting as fact some of the material which was accurate in 1954, but which is now outdated. And that was in 1970, so as you can imagine, in the over 50 years since then, presumably even more has changed, you know? So we go, right about right here, we get some aliases, and these are like the worst aliases you've ever heard. The dark haired man said, let's see now, you two are William Williams and John Jones, right? Lucky said, I'm Williams. Using that alias under ordinary conditions was second nature to Lucky by now. It was customary for Council of Science members to shun publicity at all times. It was particularly advisable now with the situ on Venus as confused and uncertain as it was. You'd think they would have got better aliases though, right? And everyone on Venus has got moustaches as well. And it kind of comes into play uh, later on in the story. And here we get um, some of the creatures that live in these waters on Venus, which obviously are in don't exist, but you know. But immediately his thoughts moved to the monster above. That was a Venusian invention too, an invention of the planet's evolution. Could such things be on Earth? Living tissue couldn't support the weight of more than 40 tons against Earth's gravity. The giant brontosauri of Earth's Mesozoic age had legs like tree trunks, yet had to remain in the marshes so that water could help buoy them up. That was the answer, water's buoyancy. In the oceans, any size of creature might exist. There were the whales of Earth, larger than any dinosaur that ever lived. But this monstrous patch above them must weigh 200 million tons, he calculated. Two million large whales put together would scarcely weigh that. Lucky wondered how old it was. How old would a thing have to be to grow as large as two million whales? A hundred years? A thousand years? Who could tell? But size could be its undoing too, even under the ocean. The larger it grew, the slower its reactions. Nerve impulses took time to travel. The bigger they are, the harder they fall. And a little bit here about uh, sort of some of the science that Asimov sort of put into his Venus. Big Man said with an effort at lightness, a visible attempt to change the current of his own thoughts. Say, Lucky, how come there's so much carbon dioxide in the air on Venus? I mean, with all these plants. Plants are supposed to turn carbon dioxide into oxygen, aren't they? On Earth they are. However, if I remember my course in Xenobotany, Venusian plant life is a trick all its own. Earth plants liberate their oxygen into the air. Venusian plants store theirs as high oxygen compounds in their tissues. He talked absently as though he himself was also using speech as a guard against too deep thinking. That's why no Venusian animal breathes. They get all the oxygen they need in their food. And actually, they get too much oxygen, which is why they're fond of like uh, low oxygen foods, like petroleum jelly, for example, which plays an important part in the plot. And then Lucky meets someone, 
and it gives this speech, which I agree with. I think intelligent life out there would say this to us as well. The voice continued, we do not think well of your people. They end life. They eat meat. It is bad to be intelligent and to eat meat. One who eats meat must end life to live, and an intelligent meat eater does more harm than a mindless one, since you can think of more ways to end life. You have little tubes that can end the lives of many at one time. And then the voice says, Although your people are given to ending life, they fear having their own lives end. We will spare you that fear if you help us. When you descend into the ocean to your life's end, we will remove fear from your mind. If, however, you do not choose to help us, we will force you into life's end anyhow, but we will not remove fear. We will intensify it. And Lucky's like, no, I don't care. So yeah, Oceans of Venus by Isaac Asimov. As I say, it's only 140 pages, so I mean, this took me like half a day to read or whatever, but it was a lot of fun. I really do enjoy the Lucky Starbucks. I gave this a four out of five, and I would recommend it if you've been thinking about reading some Asimov. So there you have it, that's what I made of Oceans of Venus. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments if you've read this book, and if so, what you thought of it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit that subscribe button for more, and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.